Welcome to our second public conversation in Introduction to Arab Studies here at Stanford University. These conversations happen in a hybrid environment where some students and guests are over Zoom, while some of us are also in a well-ventilated classroom. They are also interdisciplinary conversations covering a wide range of topics and disciplines, the humanities, we are, and the social sciences, of course. We are asking big questions about the field of Arab studies and learning from published works of great scholars. This year, all our authors were published by Stanford University Press and its leading series in Middle East studies. We thank the Urban Studies Program, the Abbasi Program in Islamic Studies, Mediterranean Studies Forum, Stanford Department of Theater and and Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity for supporting these events. Today's conversation is with Dr. Ziad Fahmi about his new book, which addresses soundscapes in Egypt. He is a professor of modern Middle East history at the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University. Professor Fahmi received his history PhD in 2007 from the University of Arizona, where his dissertation Egyptian nationalism was awarded at the Malcolm H. Kerr Dissertation Award in 2008 from the Middle East Studies Association. Professor Fahmi is the author of Street Sounds, Listening to Everyday Life in Modern Egypt, which is the topic of today's uh, conversation, and Ordinary Egyptians Creating the Modern Nation Through Popular Culture, also published by Stanford University Press in 2011. Is currently writing his third book, tentatively titled Broadcasting Identity, Radio and the Making of Modern Egypt, 1928 to 1952. His articles have appeared in Comparative Studies in Society and History, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, History Compass, and in Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. His research has been supported by Fulbright Hayes Commission, the National um, for the Humanities and American Research Center in Egypt. At Cornell University, he teaches courses such as Women in the Modern Middle East, Theory and Method in Near Eastern Studies, History of Modern Egypt, and Contesting Egyptian Identities. It is a great honor to welcome Dr. Fahmi to Stanford University for this talk. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you for this uh, very generous introduction. Just bear with me as I uh, share my screen and audio. So first, I'd uh, like to thank uh, Professor uh, Samad Asabar and Lisa Blades for inviting me uh, to present this paper. Uh, thank you also to uh, Farah Sharif and uh, Colin Hamill and the rest of the Abbasi uh, program staff for logistically uh, making uh, this possible. For those of you um, on, uh, on Zoom, uh, I know all too well about Zoom fatigue uh, in this age of COVID. So thank you for uh, showing up and listening uh, to, uh, to this talk. Um, so the, the specific uh, title uh, for this presentation uh, is uh, Working in the Streets, Silencing uh, Cairo Street Hawkers. And this paper uh, or this presentation is taken from my recently published book, as you can see it on the screen, uh, Street Sounds Listening to Everyday Life in Modern Egypt. Uh, so before I delve into the specifics of the talk, uh, I'd like to briefly give you an overview um, of, of the book so you can get a sense of where this presentation fits in uh, into the larger project. So in this book, uh, I examine uh, everyday life in Egypt uh, using sound and the politics of sound as one of the key tools uh, for uncovering the changes that went on in the Egyptian streets during the first half of the 20th century. I argue that by listening into these uh, street changes, uh, we can get a lot closer to the embodied realities of everyday life. This, I argue, uh, allows for a more micro-historical examination of everyday people's interaction with each other and helps us evaluate the impact uh, of the various street level technological and infrastructural changes uh, taking place at the turn of the 20th century and of course uh, beyond. So historians have 
recently uh, started listening to the past. Uh, con contributing to what David Hose describes as, and I quote, a sensorial revolution in the humanities and social sciences. So in the same way that all five senses are relevant to our daily understanding of the world around us, they should be vital to our understanding of the past and historical events. Examining uh, the changing soundscapes of the past and interpreting how people sonically experience their world makes possible a richer, a more comprehensive micro-level grasp of everyday life. As this presentation will reveal, uh, by you know, quote unquote listening in to the sources, historians can get uh, closer to the mundane realities taking place in the streets, revealing a great deal about how ordinary people dealt with modernity uh, and encroaching uh, state authority. This embodied microhistorical approach can also uncover uh, everyday men and women's daily struggles uh, to make a living through their use and misuse of the public streets. As I hope to demonstrate, uh, there's much to be discovered by uh, incorporating sounds and soundscapes into our methodological toolkit. But before we continue our discussion, we must address some common misconceptions uh, about the nature of sound and its suitability for uh, historical study. For contemporary events, or for many historical events that occurred in the second half of the 20th century, uh, sound and audiovisual recordings are available for examination. But how can researchers uh, fill in this sensory gap uh, when writing about historical peers before the invention of recording technology? The obvious solution to this problem can be found uh, in the same texts that historians have been using all along. Or as uh, R. Murray Schaefer, as eloquently stated, historians, and I quote, will have to turn to ear witness accounts. The fact that historians uh, silently read texts in the archives doesn't mean that the original writers were only depicting visual observations. Uh, people, of course, acquire content, meaning, and information from their physical environment using all five senses. Lest we forget, the very act of writing is as much tactile as it is visual. Uh, and of course, the information being conveyed will no doubt be uh, full of embodied uh, multi-sensory content. So by attuning uh, ourselves to the sounds described within the text, we can perceive the perspective that the original author has conveyed regarding the sounds, noises, uh, and words that they may have heard. Also, uh, writers don't just record what they have seen and heard, uh, depending on the events they are covering and the context of the document they are writing, uh, they can also detail olfactory, uh, tactile, uh, and of course, uh, gustatory information. Excuse me, gustatory information. Each uh, historical time and locale uh, has, of course, their, their varied uh, natural, animal, human, and technological sounds that play an important role uh, in defining the place to its inhabitants. Uh, these sounds have an assortment of economic, environmental, social, and cultural implications, which are vital in a well-rounded uh, understanding of the past. In Egypt, um, coffee shops were and continue to be uh, an extension of the street in, in that their spatial and sonic boundaries usually uh, expanded beyond their officially enclosed space, as we see here in, in this photograph. Weather permitting, uh, most Egyptian cafes uh, sat more people outside on the sidewalks than really inside, with obvious sonic implications for the neighborhoods that surround them. This meant that passersby, uh, be they paper boys, street vendors, entertainers, or simply pedestrians, could observe and listen to uh, if not participate in uh, the coffee shop experience. As newer, louder technologies such as gramophones and radios were introduced, the acoustic imprints of cafes must have dramatically increased as well. Commercial activity was and still is uh, loudly conducted in the sidewalks of these cafes uh, as dozens of street hawkers uh, took advantage of the already uh, seated clientele. Street hawkers uh, didn't just sell their goods near the market or to coffee shop customers. Uh, as new institutions like theaters, cinemas, and 
uh, trains and, and tram stations uh, were introduced, vendors followed with their wares and of course their loud calls. Tramways themselves um, often served as ready-made moving platforms for hawkers to make a sale. Electric tramways were not just vehicles for transporting people, uh, they also created their own embodied social and economic space, allowing for direct and indirect sociability and economic interaction across gender, culture, and class lines. Tramways were not hermetically sealed capsules, uh, and sensory perception and engagement with the street was ongoing for all passengers, especially those sitting or standing near the open doors and windows. In fact, as you can see from, from these pictures, uh, most carrying trams, uh, save for a little metal uh, side rail, were entirely open to the street. Not only were the cheapest tramway tickets affordable, but by avoiding the conductor altogether, many could easily use the tram without paying a penny. Uh, so this was frequently done uh, by children, students, and street merchants who could easily climb in and out or simply hang on to the outside of the tram. In fact, uh, the line between pedestrian and tram rider was not always clear as it was easy for a paying and non-paying passenger uh, to go in and out of the tram when it stopped in traffic or when it was uh, moving at slow speeds. Multilingual uh, signs in Arabic, English, French, and Greek uh, were posted on the trams, uh, forbidding passengers from riding on the tram footboard. Uh, these signs were, of course, as you can tell from the pictures, uh, were rarely obeyed in practice as footboards were always in use by passengers when the tram was overcrowded and by what I call uh, tram surfers uh, who latch outside uh, onto the outside of, uh, of the tram to avoid uh, paying the fare. So newspaper boys, uh, shoe blacks, and trinket sellers uh, also relied on the footboard for jumping on and off uh, the moving tram at will. This sort of tram surfing was very common in Egypt um, as this 1918 account confirms. And I'm quoting, if the regulations about riding on footboards were enforced, the hawkers of meats, drinks, and knickknacks would not plague you with their constant solicitations. The, the boot boys carry on their trade furtively between the seats. Often they ride for a mile, uh, working hard at a half a dozen boots. The police of course uh, attempted to limit tram surfing, and in 1921, just uh, in the Abdeen district of Cairo, uh, there were 731 citations that were given uh, for illegal tram riding. However, by all accounts, this was just a drop in the bucket and did very little uh, uh, to discourage the practice. For example, uh, an American couple uh, living in Egypt as late as 1955 uh, remarked, and I'm quoting, we are able to spend many enjoyable hours exploring the city. These journeys were usually made by tram, a most exciting experience as the majority of Cairo trams are open at either side and travel so slowly that peddlers can come and go at will, even when the tram is in motion. So um, public transportation and trams in particular provided a sort of moving uh, platform uh, for riders to, to talk, buy, sell, and engage in a variety of social and economic interactions as a physically moving space that outsiders can enter and exit with ease. Uh, tramways, of course, are neither private nor entirely public. In many ways, tram surfing illustrates uh, the relative liminality of the tram as a new modern space, uh, which on a daily basis allowed for embodied and loud interaction. Moreover, uh, the use and misuse of the tram uh, by paying and non-paying passengers, street hawkers, and even pickpockets uh, indicates that trams were, the, uh, for the most part, uh, almost entirely appropriated by the urban residents for their own use, going well beyond the intended use as basic transportation. Street hawkers had uh, regular routes in most urban residential neighborhoods. Uh, the loudness and pitch of their calls were essential uh, to reaching inside the homes of their customers. It was more than just the actual words being sounded. Um, it was the unique inflection, tone, and pitch of a particular seller's voice that signaled from a distance the exact product being sold. 
The astute listener could then approximate the distance and time of the hawker's arrival, uh, giving them, of course, time to walk down the stairs and conduct the transaction. For smaller items, the customers didn't need to descend to the streets. Uh, most households had handy wicker baskets attached to long ropes, which they could send down cash and bring up the purchased goods. Uh, in these scenarios, both the buyers, uh, who are predominantly women, and the sellers shouted the details of the transactions for all to hear. Building walls uh, visually created a partition separating private from public. Uh, but at the time, especially in the early parts of the 20th century, most walls could hardly stop sound from traveling through. Windows, uh, balconies, and doors enhanced the sonic penetration and served as uh, you know, sensory portals connecting residents with their neighbors uh, and of course their neighborhood. There was uh, little sound insulation in walls uh, in late 19th and mid 20th century houses and residences in poorer districts didn't have glass windows to even slightly buffer against street sound. Road noises and even loud conversations were easily heard inside houses and apartments. In most cases, um, that was not necessarily undesirable as connecting with your neighbors and interacting with street hawkers was not only convenient, but also the, the expected norm. Windows, balconies, and rooftops had the potential to become, yet again, as we talked about with the tramways, liminal zones that were neither private nor entirely public, especially when they were actively used uh, as platforms for such uh, social and economic engagement. The mere presence of uh, hawkers in the streets uh, in significant numbers created regular spheres of physical interaction and conversation with pedestrians, uh, other vendors, store owners, uh, and even residents, as we just talked about, who had their windows or doors open. The more one listens to these interactions, the more it becomes apparent uh, that this public versus private sphere split was never as rigid uh, uh, as theorized. For example, uh, Mary Waitley, a longtime resident of late 19th century Cairo, uh, wrote that she often heard through her window her neighbors talking to each other uh, and to street merchants. Waitley's uh, neighbor, for example, uh, who regularly sat on her reed mat selling sugar canes in the street corner next to her window, and I'm quoting, talked incessantly to anyone who came within earshot, whether customer or not. Waitley uh, also vividly described how in the late afternoons, uh, when the street merchants were closing up their accounts, she would regularly hear, and I quote, a few sharp bargainers trying to get oranges, beans, et cetera, at a lower rate than before. The clatter of tongues was quite astonishing. So Whaley could uh, clearly hear these conversations from, from her window. So again, windows, doors, rooftops, and balconies more directly focused the auditory and sometimes visual interactions uh, between those who are partly on the inside and yet still engaged in varying uh, degrees with their neighbors or street hawkers on the outside, uh, providing uh, liminal spaces of direct sensory interaction that were neither entirely public nor private. In Egypt, um, a significant number of the street hawkers were women. In fact, uh, many late 19th and early 20th century observers have noted a somewhat gendered division of labor among uh, the male and female street hawkers. Again, uh, Mary Waitley, who in the 1860s and 70s uh, lived in the Kyrene district of uh, Bab al uh, remarked that Egyptian women typically sold <clears throat> milk, clotted cream, yogurt, oranges, radishes, real corn, sugarcane, and other fresh produce. Uh, in 1902, Muhammad Omar uh, corroborates and expands on Waitley's assessment by stating that men uh, specialize in selling matches, books, shoes, sweets, clothing, pistachios, butarga, uh, textiles, cheese, breadsticks, newspapers, peanuts, oil, whistles, bracelets, uh, pottery, and everything for a penny. Or, uh, and, and those of you that know uh, Egyptian Arabic, kol haqab um, I guess it's the equivalent of the dollar store today. So according uh, uh, to, to Omar, women um, sold flowers, textiles, rose water, uh, dates, milk, honey, ghee, oranges, dates, and corn. So this observed uh, division of labor between male and, and uh, female street merchants uh, was not really hard and fast as I found plenty of evidence 
for example, of women selling jewelry and cheese. Uh, in any case, there isn't really uh, uh, any strong evidence of any official or social mechanism that specifically for, uh, forbade female vendors from selling a particular product. So up to the, the first half of the 20th century, uh, the number and variety of calls from street merchants dwarfed what they are today. A uh, contemporary observer uh, in mid-1930s Cairo documented 165 distinct calls by street hawks, and that was just for food sellers. Uh, the merchants loudly and melodically emphasized the freshness, uh, ripeness, taste, size, or geographic origins uh, of the food that they were selling. Comparisons uh, often amusing or exaggerated were sometimes used to drive the point home to buyers. Tomatoes, for example, could be the size of pomegranates or as red as roses. Because Egyptians uh, preferred small cucumbers, mainly for, for pickling, um, they were often likened to kidney beans. Some declared that their dates were as good as lamb. Pistachio sellers compared their products to grilled quail and sellers of barbecue corn uh, announced that their corn was as tasty as roasted chicken. If the tenderness of uh, the food was important, then the sellers loudly chanted, even the toothless can eat them. Upon seeing a child uh, playing in the, in the streets, uh, candy vendors would yell out, or cry out to your mother, little boy, uh, urging young children uh, to beg their mothers for candy. There were dozens of uh, non-vocal auditory cues used by vendors selling candy and other sweets to children. Writing about his childhood uh, during the late 1910s in Cairo, Sayyid Zainab district, Fathi Radwan vividly remembers uh, many of these distinct calls and sounds. He recalls how uh, the seller of a, of a traditional caramel had the long uh, pieces of the toffee-like candy attached to a long pole with a rattle at the end of it. This is a, a, a photograph depicting a, a similar a type of candy being sold in a village, but not necessarily in Cairo, but this is exactly what Radwan was talking about. According to Radwan, when the vendor uh, shook the pole, it produced a loud, irresistible rattling sound that drove all the neighboring uh, children crazy as they came out of the woodwork with their pennies in hand. Adwan also uh, recalls a, a vendor selling vanilla wafers uh, who employed a variety of sonic tools uh, to advertise his arrival. Not only did he uh, uh, blow on a small horn, but he made a loud cracking sound by beating two pieces of wood against each other. And for good measure, he sometimes shouted, let's go vanilla or vanilla cookies for all to hear. Uh, butane tank merchants uh, who are still heard throughout Egypt uh, could signal their arrival to an entire neighborhood without uttering a single word. Um, striking their metal butane cylinder with a wrench, they produce a familiar loud and rhythmic clanking uh, that sonically carried for several, uh, several uh, city blocks. I mean, I guess remembering uh, uh, my uh, growing up in, in central New Jersey, uh, the good humor ice cream man. And once he blew the, his bell on the loudspeaker, you know, we all came out of the woodwork as well. So this is not necessarily something that's completely distant in the distant past. Uh, lemonade, uh, sherbet, and licorice juice sellers uh, rhythmically clanked their large castanets. And I'll show you in a second. Uh, actually, I think you'll get to hear them. Um, and uh, so they had these brass saucers that they would clink together loudly. Uh, to advertise their loud drinks. And, and during the summer, uh, cold drinks, uh, uh, cold, excuse me, cold, uh, cold drink sellers and their clanking sounds were prevalent in, in the traditional districts of Cairo uh, well into the mid uh, 20th century. Perhaps the earliest uh, sounded film recording of one of these drink sellers uh, was captured in the winter of 1928 uh, in the raw footage of a newsreel by the Fox Movie Tone Company. A licorice juice seller, surrounded by a mass of people in Cairo's of Hossein district, uh, performed in front of the camera while clanking his, his brass saucers uh, for close to 20 seconds. And I'll be playing you that short clip today. I think the volume is, is a bit low, but uh, just pay attention. <laughs> Yes. Yes. 
You can listen carefully, you can hear some of the footsteps in the conversation. Still in the Hossein district. The creaking sound of the cart. Of course, this guy wants to be on camera. All right. So, uh, in, in part because of the the transit uh, the transitory nature of street hawkers, their relationship with the Egyptian state was and still is. Uh, rife with tension. Unsuccessful attempts at regulating, documenting, and taxing them uh, began in the mid 19th century and continue to this day. Uh, these regulations attempted not only to dictate where and when these merchants could sell their wares, uh, but also they attempt to control their, their hygiene, the volume of their calls, and they try to dictate what time of day they can loudly advertise their merchandise. For example, on paper at least, Street hawkers were not allowed to make their calls after sunset, and during the summer, they were forbidden uh, to sell their goods during siesta time, approximately from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Of course, these laws were hard to regulate, as I'll talk about in a second. Uh, it's, it's, important, it's important to note that the, the vast majority of, of these street hawkers uh, were unregulated, and though these laws were on the books, they were unevenly enforced. Uh, just like today, uh, police abuse of street merchants was common. As uh, dozens of petitions to the Egyptian government in the 1930s and 40s attest, uh, police beatings, arrests, and embezzling money from unlicensed merchants was quite common. When uh, placed under arrest, the most common offense was obstructing traffic. In an October 16, uh, 1944 petition to King Farouk, Abdel Maqsoud Khalaf Hassan, the self proclaimed president of the Public Union of Knickknack Peddlers, declares, and I quote The police are constantly harassing and chasing after us in the streets and alleyways as if we are criminals running from justice. The truth is that we're merely trying to make an honest living. We are without any rights, we endure daily toil and suffer backbreaking work just to barely make ends meet. The doors to other professions are closed shut for us. This is the only means for our livelihood and it is honest work. We work in the coldest of winter nights and hottest of summer days. We sell merely sunglasses, pens, and knickknacks, which are very small and light. We certainly do not cause any traffic obstruction as is often proclaimed by the police. After making his case, Hassan then uh, uh, proceeded uh, to uh, lay out three basic demands from the government. One, stop chasing after and arresting street hawkers. Two, uh, reform the current laws. Three, facilitate the attainment of street hawker licenses. So not surprisingly, none of these demands were met as three years later, uh, yet another petition was filed complaining of the exact same police abuse uh, this uh, new petition, dated March 27, 1940, uh, March 27, 1947, asked the government to recognize and license more street hawkers in order to legitimize, uh, legitimate their economic activity. So these uh, two petitions and many others like them uh, suggest that the laws concerning street hawkers were only partly enforced. So even though according to uh, state regulations, street merchants were supposed to have licenses, Few of these licenses were given out um, as they were very difficult to obtain. These uneven and often unsuccessful efforts uh, by the police to silence and uh, uh, restrict the activities of street merchants continue to this day. Street hawkers still strive in the Egyptian streets and their voices continue to be heard. We can talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, after, after the talk in the, uh, in the question uh, session. Uh, so I want to uh, uh, begin 
my uh, conclusion uh, by reading you a, a quote from uh, Michel de Certeau's The Practice of Everyday Life. The ordinary practitioners of the city live down below, below the threshold at which visibility begins. They walk, an elementary form of experiencing the city. They are walkers whose bodies follow the thicks and thins of an urban text, which they write without being able to read it. These practitioners make use of space that cannot be seen. Their knowledge of them is as blind as that of lovers in each other's arms. De Certeau's depiction of uh, life down below in the street level captures an embodied extra visual sensory knowledge that ordinary urban dwellers have of their immediate environment. To a city resident, there is an innate sensory familiarity to the neighborhood street, supplementing uh, known sites with equally familiar pleasant or unpleasant sounds, smells, and tastes. Even the touch and feel of specific dips, curves, and cracks in the streets and sidewalks become intimately and blindly familiar to pedestrians as they daily uh, take the same route to work, school, or the market. So the Certeau's insistence on the importance of walking the city is in effect using a multi-sensory understanding of urging, excuse me, a multi-sensory understanding of space. By literally or figuratively walking in the streets, one can move beyond the watchful gaze of the state or beyond the two-dimensional plans and maps that were drawn out and put, put into place by uh, state bureaucrats. As I demonstrated in this talk, uh, by moving closer, and listening into street life, uh, we can partly reveal how people live their everyday lives and more importantly, clarify how they dealt with state authorities in their mundane struggles over the use and ownership of the streets. Compared to other approaches, a sensory approach is also more embodied and intimate as it sheds more light on how ordinary people uh, adapted to the plethora of modernizing ch changes taking place during the first half of the 20th century. The Egyptian streets uh, were not only a living, breathing laboratory for rapidly unfolding infrastructural and technological change, but also it was one of the few places where most elements of society could potentially at least interact face to face. I focused on Egyptians who made uh, uh, their living in the streets from pedestrians and tram riders to merchants and street hawkers all of whom, of course, uh, left their sonic imprints in the archives. Walking through and using and misusing the city streets is in itself an act of appropriation as pedestrians uh, sensorially projected their presence. People take ownership of the streets when they use them, whether they are simply walking through, uh, sitting in an outdoor cafe, or selling their goods in the city squares and roads. As we examined, um, these embodied uh, possessions of public spaces were not always uncontested. The police and the political authorities always attempted to limit, uh, control, and regulate the use of public roads. However, the panoptic powers of the modern state uh, were never as neat, efficient, and controlling uh, as they are sometimes portrayed. Everyday people daily used and misused the streets for their own purposes to loudly sell, buy, mourn, uh, and celebrate, often breaking a host of state regulations in the process. Street hawkers, um, in particular, frequently petitioned the state to address their grievances, while countless other men and women uh, adapted to all the rapid structural and technological uh, uh, changes by appropriating the very streets and technologies as their own. Ordinary pedestrians, uh, beggars, commuters, paying and non-paying tram passengers, street vendors, and even pickpockets use and misuse the electric proms, buses, streets, and sidewalks for their own purposes, which effectively allow them to lay claim to the streets and adapt the very infrastructure of modernity for their own use. So there are many more uh, historical dimensions to be discovered uh, if we are open to considering sound as a serious path of inquiry for understanding the past. Sound historian uh, Jonathan Stern accurately declared, and I quote, that there is always more than one map for a territory and sound provides a particular path through the history. By finding and interpreting new auditory data, 
historians uh, can add new sensory dimensions to their historical analysis, transforming how we understand the past. So as the growing uh, field of sound studies has shown, comprehending the daily experiences of ordinary people requires us to listen more to the past. Thank you. Bear with me as I get out. There we go. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Um, you uh, mentioned nostalgia uh, a few moment, a, a few times in, in the book, and uh, I have to tell you uh, that nostalgia is something that I truly feel as you speak, um, uh, and uh, that. Uh, my first question to you. Uh, I will. I first. I want to encourage um, all of our attendees and students in the class to put in their question uh, to the uh, webinar question area, and I will uh, bring up the questions as I moderate the discussion with Dr. Fahmi. Um, so, um, I, I want to start with this question uh, that is actually quite personal to me. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, in in Arab areas uh, have a sense of what a city is, what a neighborhood is. And it's like this Hara sells this, this Hara sells that. And there's a kind of a, uh, the soundscape as you describe it really determines what, what that feels like. And in your book, you do uh, show us a kind of a battle of a kind of a sort of tradition past and present. Um, and I am curious, when you're working on a project of this kind, what does it feel like as a researcher? You know, nostalgia is not only a topic, it seems to be also a feeling that one experiences as a researcher. So I'm curious uh, about your own feelings, your own engagements, your own sense uh, as you go through this archive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, uh, archives are, don't just exist in a vacuum, and you bring your own experiences to the table when you're doing any sort of research. Um, and in a way, uh, it wasn't just what I uh, uh, personally experienced as in my upbringing and growing up in, in Alexandria, Egypt, and so forth. Uh, also, intentionally, as I was conducting my archival research, I always, I obviously had my antennas you know, out and about. And, and as I was living in, in, in Cairo at the time, a few years ago, uh, I would always, you know, pay attention a little bit more. Um, and because uh, often when we're sort of living in a particular environment, it's almost a subconscious thing where we're, we're immediately, we, we definitely are engaged with all five senses, we're, we're interacting uh, 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 all the time with them. Um, but in addition to that, as I was conducting the research, I also uh, intentionally listened. And, and, and felt and all of those things. And, and, and many of, of uh, 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 there are still street hawkers, for example, all over Cairo and Alexandria and elsewhere. So I, even though they're outside the period the, that I'm studying, uh, I, off, I would often re record them just simply on my iPhone uh, throughout as I was heading to the archives and back and so forth. So I always was a little bit more attuned uh, to sounds as I was writing it. Um, and it, that helps a great deal as, as I'm sort of focused on the documents themselves to try to sort of reimagine uh, some of those sounds. Um, obviously, when I got into the research itself, I wasn't expecting to find you know, some uh, recordings like the film that I just showed from 1928, which fits right smack in the middle of the period that I'm covering. Uh, and that, of course, is sort of the icing on the cake and then added a little bit more uh, uh, to, to help my imagination of how these, these, the, the, the impacts of these sounds that, that occurred in the past. Um, having said all this, uh, I think even if I was uh, conducting research in the 18th or 17th century of sounds that I've never heard before, uh, I think there is a way to try to engage with the written text uh, to try to sort of un uncover, uh, 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 not necessarily, not uncover what these sounds were, that's not the point, or, or how they sounded, but how the people interacted with, with their sounded environment. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, you, you don't necessarily, you're always going to bring to the table your own experiences, uh, but to some extent, I think uh, um, uh, other historians have, have worked in the 18th century and in the 17th century. Uh, the French historian, his name is Alain Corbin, for example, that, that uh, 
uh, wrote an, almost, an entire book almost just on, on, on uh, the sound of bells in, in, in France uh, uh, in the 18th century. Um, as a follow up to that question, and uh, we, we're, we're starting to get the questions in from our audience, but uh, as a follow up to that question, what does it mean to be potentially um, different as a native, someone who might uh, have a personal experience to a culture versus someone who might come to it as a, a newcomer? Um, uh, the reason I ask you the question is that while reading the book, it felt that there was an intimacy with the culture and the sound, uh, uh, the language, uh, or, you know, the kind of what's important and what's not, that it really did feel like a kind of intimacy that it's not that any historian can do this work. Um, and it felt that you brought something to it that I would call a native sensitivity, sensi sensibility. Um, uh, am, I, am I misguided in thinking uh, that um, this work uh, does have a native to it uh, and not anyone could do this? And here, I'm not saying that, you know, only Egyptians should research <laughs> Egypt. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that different books and different studies have different sensibilities. And this one feels to me that it has an internal logic that is uh, that I recognize as a native sensibility. Can you reflect on that at all? And feel free to tell me I'm wrong. No, uh, I will say, um, but I think that goes for any topic, for any anyone writing uh, any particular scholarly work, they're always gonna bring themselves into it uh, to some extent. Uh, so yes, to, to uh, I'll agree partially to what you're saying in the sense that having lived through some of these sounds in my childhood, uh, or, 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 or I can be a little bit more in tune uh, to the text themselves, and it's easier for me to read the sources, but I think a historian that is not a native speaker or not someone who is originally from Egypt can certainly do this work, but it would be more difficult. It would require a lot more, more training to be able to, to do it. Um, I found that to be the case also for my first book when I focused on the vernacular and especially the, 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 the very colloquial uh, street language of, 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 of Egypt. Uh, so it would be a lot more difficult for me uh, to conduct a similar study if I'm using uh, the Moroccan vernacular, for example. Um, and so you're always going to add something a little bit more to it. But that doesn't mean that a, a scholar uh, who was an outsider uh, can't do this type of work. Maybe not to the, the same degree. It might be different. I might look at in a different with a, using a different theoretical lens. Um, but expanding that a little bit further to some of the sources that I use, even in, in this particular talk, I often find the reverse to be true when I'm examining sources. So, for example, when uh, uh, if it's an, a native Egyptian that's been living their entire life in Egypt. So, uh, uh, and, and they're writing about some of these sounds, they're often not even going to write about them because they're, they're so mundane and they're so everywhere around them. And it's often the, the tourist or the, the person who was a foreigner living in Cairo that will really pay attention to documenting a lot of those uh, uh, sensory events that are happening around them, whether it's, it's, it's sounded or, or, or other forms of, of, of the senses. Uh, so travel literature is, is full and, and more abundantly full of these observations. Uh, and, 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 and these accounts of, of sounds and, 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 and smells and so forth. Um, so the opposite could also uh, uh, sort of round out this whole equation. Um, but um, it's certainly something that I, that I paid atten attention to when I was examining the sources themselves. In the case of uh, Fathir Adwan, who I also quoted here, um, the reason that his work is so rich in some of the of the sensory information is that it was it was written about his childhood and and so often when you're when you're uh, nostalgia as, as you alluded to earlier on uh, in your question connects very strongly to the senses uh, and often when we remember the past our childhood in particular or at any other any other period in the past um, it will be mixed with you know smells and, and, and sounds and uh, in addition to, to the visual aspects. 
uh, but certainly the sense, the other sensory aspects, extra visual aspects are, are, are really more vivid when we remember. Um, and it doesn't, it's obviously uh, doesn't indicate that it's more accurate because often it's, it's, it's nostalgia is often something that is uh, um, um, exaggerated um, and, uh, and I allude to that in the conclusion of, of, of the book. Uh, often you sort of romanticize the past uh, and, uh, uh, and so everything smelled great uh, in my childhood <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. And you sort of remember th things fondly, very rarely do you remember uh, the, 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 you know, the things that, that, that you didn't like, so. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I will go to uh, uh, the first uh, question in our um, uh, uh, question uh, area here. Um, and it comes from Marina Bergenstock. Uh, it says, capturing the subtle changes in Egyptian street life culture uh, of industrialization and urbanization through sound seems like a unique and kind lenses to study the changes within a society. Kind because it cares about the people on the ground and their relationship to their environment manner and unique because when we think of studying a culture of people, we often center conversations around lasting monuments like buildings or mountains. But sounds are very hard to capture. Sounds are by nature fleeting. How do you think the non-tangibility of sound adds or detracts from what is, is it, uh, uh, what comes to us? Uh, great question. Uh, I'll start with sort of uh, uh, how you, you ended your, your question. I, I would uh, say that I don't necessarily agree that that sound is more fleeting than, let's say, the, the visual. Um, I think because I'm uh, dealing primarily with with text and, and in the archives, um, the the writers that I'm that I'm reading, or, or even even the memoirs, they'll they'll talk about things that they've seen and things that they've heard. Uh, but I, I I view both as equal in a sense that that they're. They're, they're all fleeting. All our senses are fleeting. I mean, in a way we remember what, especially for those who are writing down any sort of observation or anything that they heard and so forth, whether it's in the archives or memoirs or any written text, um, the moment that you, after you write it down, that's it, that moment is gone. So it's, it's also fleeting. So in a way it's sort of filtered through our own uh, uh, lens and our, our own brain. And once it's, 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 it's put into ink, it's something that no longer exists and, and fleeting and, and, and gone into the ether, let's say. Uh, and so my job is not to uh, fully capture the reality of how things sounded. It's to try to, as much as possible, see how everyday people engage with their, with their environment. And I just found it that what, when they're talking about and, and writing about things that they've heard, it's often a, 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 a sort of micro history. It's often something that is close and personal. Uh, it's often something that is happening in, in, on, in the street level. And that's what helped me throughout this project and, and helped focus me uh, in, in my analysis of, of the sources themselves. Um, and in a way, it's just a, a tool in, in, my, in, in the historian's toolbox to try to get to the intimate, to try to get to what's happening on the street level. But I'm not necessarily ready to, even though I know where uh, the questioner is coming from, uh, but I think it's, it's something that we assume that you know, sounds are gone, but then a, a visual observation is something a little bit more solid. Or, uh, I think I view all the senses uh, equally in a sense, from a historical perspective, at least when I'm looking at a text. Uh, it's about memory. It's about uh, uh, how the person who was writing that particular test uh, a text is, is engaged with their environment and how they try to um, take, a, uh, 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 take account of that moment and, and, and depict it in their particular text. Um, I'm not ready to say that the, the visual is, is more concrete or, uh, 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 or elevate one of the senses over the other as far as that, as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. But I hope I got the, the question right. <laughs> 
Uh, yes, uh, actually, I, I did uh, mislabel a question. The, the question came from uh, Jackie Bissera, uh, and she follows up on it and uh, asks, do you believe uh, sound and other various auditory components are often uh, a dis disregarded sense when studying our surroundings? Why do you think that might be? Yes, I, I think that's the case. Um... And, uh, but it's changing because of sound studies as, as uh, uh, as scholarship is in the last 15 years or so, it's, it's really becoming a little bit more robust. Um, I think in part because we tend to privilege the visual a lot more. Um, and uh, and uh, I don't wanna delve into, because there's a whole history behind this. So and I, we don't really have time to discuss it, but um, I think we often, uh, tend to um, elevate the sort of visual observation as something that is that is more uh, accurate or, or something that is that is more correct. Um, and um, I'm not saying it's it's less correct than than the auditory. I'm just saying that we have to interrogate that a little bit further. Uh, and that if we pay attention to some of the other senses, we'll 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 add to the we'll add a little bit more uh, uh, to our understanding. Um, and, and so, because we are multi-sensory creatures, uh, and this is how we sort of interact with our environment using our five senses. Uh, you might say one is, is more accurate than the other. I don't know, I'm, I'm not in the business of trying to create a hierarchy, uh, but I think if, if we are going to try to be true to un understanding uh, the past uh, to the best of our abilities, uh, the more we integrate all five senses, uh, the more we'll be able to try and get a little bit more uh, 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 what was going on in, in the lives of, of everyday people. Um, I have a question from Mejgan Masumi. Uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Um, uh, Masumi says, uh, Professor Fahmi, thank you for your erudite analysis and detailed examples of street sounds in modern Egypt. I am a huge fan of your work and also enjoyed reading your first book, Ordinary Egyptians, in which the public the realm of popular culture to distill an understanding of national identity. I think an interesting aspect of your work in both projects is this question of who has the right to the city, whether we are learning about Egyptian culture in popular print or popular sound, there is this interesting negotiation that happens between the people and the state. What are your thoughts about the ways in which public culture, whether through the as you eloquently map or through public media is also a site of resistance to the state or to hegemony that seeks to control and discipline the public. Um, I, the last part of the question was cutting out. Could you repeat the, the just sure. the last part? Sure. Um, what are your thoughts about the ways in which public culture is also a site of resistance to the state that seeks to control and discipline the public. Yeah, um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I talk uh, more about this I, uh, in, in, uh, in my first book, uh, but I guess also to some extent in, 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 this, in this book as well, in some of the later chapters when I talk about weddings and funerals and so forth, um, there's always going to be this, this tension um, between sort of official state-sponsored culture uh, and popular culture. Um, and, and, uh, it, but it's not necessarily something that's black and white because they, they both often bleed into each other. I mean, uh, for any sort of official state culture to be effective, uh, that you have to sort of mine uh, 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 the streets for uh, culturally relevant things that would matter to people. Um, but often uh, it's the case that uh, certain aspects of popular culture will 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 speak out against against the state in a variety of different ways, and it really depends on which period and which era we're talking about, uh, and what sorts of, of censorship are in, are in place. Uh, but there's always ways around it. Um, so um, it, to give you an example, um, when uh, eventually I'm writing a book on Egyptian radio now, um, even though I'll end it in in around fifty two. Uh, but um, starting as early as 34, Egyptian radio was nationalized and brought under the umbrella of the state. Beforehand, there was about six years or so where it was more, uh, uh, there was 
you know, private radio stations, a variety of different views. But even when that happened, um, you had other ways and other venues for Egyptians to express their own uh, views. Um, so when, when Egyptian state radio became under the, the control of the Egyptian state, they of course had, you know, could police the airwaves as far as what was being played on the radio. Uh, but if you were to uh, uh, listen to some of the phonograph records uh, and more importantly, later on, especially in the 1970s with uh, uh, cassette tape technology, that really allowed for a very robust sort of public culture to come out. And, and not always was it necessarily uh, sort of against the state, uh, but it, it portrayed a more uh, street level type of culture. Uh, some of it was certainly explicitly against the state, the, uh, uh, the, the poetry and the music of, of, of Sheikh Imam and, and others and, and so forth. Um, but there's always this tug of war and this back and forth. Um, and, um, and, and, and nowadays, of course, uh, it connects to other forms of technology from you know, YouTube to, uh, uh, to other uh, uh, digital formats uh, where uh, people can sort of escape uh, uh, the clutches of the state, yet the state is fighting back and, and using all forms of, of uh, 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 technologies to try to uh, uh, control those spaces as well. So it's always this back and forth. Uh, we have a question from uh, Michael Kehan from Urban Studies, um, uh, who are one of our co-sponsors. Um, Michael says, I really appreciate this talk, very fascinating. I wonder if you could say more about Orientalism and sound. Was it difficult to use colonial and touristic accounts as sources because of the way the author's perception were influenced by auditory stereotypes? Yes, absolutely. Um... And uh, even the, some of the writers that were uh, more sympathetic um, to, and, and sort of Mary Waitley was certainly one of those characters. Um, there's always going to be this sort of Orientalist bias, you know, either within the colonial archives uh, or by uh, ordinary people who are living in Cairo at, at the time. Um, and yeah, you have to be very careful when you're, when you're using uh, these sources. Uh, but at the same time, they can also be very valuable for the, uh, uh, the same reason that I alluded to earlier uh, in, 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 the, in the first question, um, in that they often, when you're from outside the area, you're a traveler, uh, you will pay attention, you know, a lot more to uh, your sonic environment, but also your sensory environment. And so I don't want to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and in many ways, uh, you just have to be very critical when you're exa and examining these sources and read them a little bit against the grain. Um, some were, 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 were sympathetic and, and less orientalist than others, but they're all going to have this inherent bias to them. Um, and actually, the, many of the Egyptian authors have a you know, similar bias as well. And so uh, uh, um, and in, in, in the book, I discussed that in, in, in detail. Um, but as long as you have your, you know, your critical glasses on as, as you're reading uh, and you're careful and treading lightly, uh, I think these sources can, can be valuable. Uh, I have a question here from Marina Bergestock. This is actually her question, uh, <laughs> which was labeled earlier. Uh, she says, I'm really interested in your writing about the contradiction incongruities and fissures between class identity and national solidarity. You write that in moments of national crisis, the middle class and cultural elite seek to validate their own Egyptianness to some idealized national type. Can you talk more about the slippage that happens for the working class people between being viewed as loud to being seen uh, as part of symbols of resist, resilience and resourcefulness, the slippage work for the more for the more elite classes in the same way. Again, you were I, I got most of the question, but at the end, the sound cut off. Sure. Can you talk about? Can you talk more about the slippage? that happens for the working class people between being viewed as loud and uh, I think the word is bayara to being seen at oh bia bia to being 
uh, seen as simple symbols of uh, resilience and resourcefulness, does this uh, slippage work for the more elite classes in the same way? Uh, thank you for an excellent question. You obviously read the book and definitely read the conclusion. Um, yeah, I think this happens almost in, in every culture in, in moments of um, national solidarity for whatever reason, whenever sort of the flag is waved, uh, often class lines tend to uh, disappear just for that moment. And, and then they rear, uh, rear up again later on and you, and you find a lot more of this sort of class division. Um, and I can see this throughout, throughout the sources and, and through different eras and different periods in, in, in Egyptian history really. Um, and uh, whenever there was a moment of national solidarity and class lines are erased uh, and, and often uh, working class people and everyday Egyptians are viewed as sort of the, the archetypal representation of uh, uh, Egyptianness. Um, for the elites, um, you can certainly find some examples of uh, sort of the, the, the elites described in, in a negative light, um, but not as much as uh, the popular classes because more often than not, they're the ones that are sort of the gatekeeper, the cultural gatekeepers uh, of, of, and I can, I, and again, elite here is broadly conceived from sort of intellectual elites to, uh, to, to, uh, to other elites as well. Uh, so there are less examples of them being more, viewed more critically uh, 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 in, in popular culture and elsewhere. Sometimes, sometimes they are, uh, so they're, uh, for example, in, 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 in some works where they're viewed as collaborators with the colonial regime, for example, they're viewed in a negative light. Uh, but when all of a sudden, uh, uh, during 1919, uh, especially the, during the revolution and the months in the, in the revolution where, where everybody's in the streets, there were a concerted effort uh, to examine both the, the masses and the elites as sort of one, all the Egyptians are one. You can go back to even uh, uh, 2011. Uh, there was a similar case when there's this national euphoria uh, a lot of uh, uh, people in their discourses in the press and, and elsewhere, like, yes, we're all one people. And, uh, but then months afterwards, uh, these cracks and fissures, the class line fissures uh, uh, come to the fore uh, and then they come back again. And, and then there are more, more divisions for a variety of different reasons. And, and typically it's the elite wanting stability. Uh, and that happened in 1919, just like it did in, in post 2011 uh, uh, Egypt. Um, so, uh... Going to this idea of how you're dealing with these questions methodologically, uh, I'm curious um, in terms of, you, you give nods to uh, Tiz Wiedenberg uh, and Thor Amherst um, and other scholars early on as, as people who have started us on these questions of sound and music and popular culture and so on. And I'm curious in terms of method theory and discipline, um, how do you self-identify as a historian? Uh, how do you identify as a person who clearly uh, consciously using uh, a critical theoretical um, uh, writings, uh, you bring in Disserto, for example, um, uh, the idea of production of space is all over the place and, and so on. And then um, uh, in terms of discipline, uh, this book could have been uh, quite easily in, uh, for example, theater and performance studies. Actually, it would have been a, you know, I mean, it's a great theater and performance studies book. It's a great book that uses anthropological methods, though it is not explicit about it. Um, there are comparative elements to it. It's truly interdisciplinary, uh, Middle East studies, Arab studies, uh, and yet you are uh, a historian. Uh, so how can we can we talk a little bit about your scholarly identity and and where you find yourself in this mess that is so called <laughs> studies or Arab studies? Honestly, um, I mean this probably goes back to even my my first book. Um, I tried my best not to put on disciplinary shackles <laughs> as much as possible, um, and. I guess it helps that this is the second book, sort of a post tenure book and, and so forth. And, and so where I wasn't necessarily going at it from a particular uh, disciplinary perspective, I wanted to 
uh, write this book about, you know, sounds and, and street life. And I used whatever tools I had at my disposal. Um, and um, I am sure that some hardcore traditional historians are, are going to be very uh, upset or disappointed or, or viewing me as sort of outside the fold. Um, and I've had encounters with some, you know, older traditional historians that, you know, uh, didn't get it in a way. And, and, and that's fine because it is, I, I, it's a different book. Uh, I, I'm glad that it, it could have different uh, uh, disciplinary homes or multidisciplinary aspects to it and people could use whatever they like from it. Um, it's, something, it's something that I, that I wanted to write and I, I, I didn't really restrict myself. I think what helped me in the process is, is uh, at Cornell, there's the Society of Humanities and there was a theme back in 2012 or 2011 uh, and it was on sounds and soundscapes. And, and, and I was lucky enough to, to, to be awarded this, this fellowship. And, and for an entire year, I was meeting with these multidisciplinary scholars from around the country that were uh, uh, meeting at the uh, AD Whitehall at, at Cornell. And, um, and it really it was an eye opener uh, in a sense, and I was already interested in sound, and you know, and and but but uh, 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 it introduced me to a variety of ways to really looking at sounds and soundscape studies. I mean, you had ethnomusicologists, uh, 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 philosophers, and uh, 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 cognitive scientists, all kinds of different people from a variety of different fields, just focusing on sounds and soundscapes. And um, that really was a, a moment where uh, it really helped me think through. Um, the different, but I never said, oh, I, to, you know, as I was writing this, yes, I will view, I will approach this as a historian or as a historically minded anthropologist or, uh, and so on. I was just, here are the sources. Uh, I am, I'm going to read as widely as possible. And um, I'm, I'm going to just, you know, write, write this book. Um, perhaps it wouldn't have been uh, a good first book uh, because you're always, um, you do have more of these disciplinary handcuffs for the first book because it tends to be a revised dissertation. So it really depends on your committee. Um, so um, I was lucky for my first book that my committee was hands off. So I was able to just go in, in different directions. Uh, and so I, I felt like maybe just keep doing that for the second book and went a little bit more uh, um, to the extreme. So uh, I hope that some that, his, that other historians would, would accept uh, this book uh, as well, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. I do think this is a great history book, and I, I don't want to be, be misunderstood. I, I, it is a great history book. In fact, uh, uh, as a, uh, it, it may not be a documentary history by definition, but the amount of documentation that takes place throughout is quite stunning. Um, so, uh, and, and the idea of documenting sound in the past is not an easy feat. So all the respect to you for having the patience Thank you. <laughs> and the imagination. And, in the, and by the imagination, I say the creativity to actually send yourself to the past and reimagine situation and context in order to give us this, uh, this narrative that Sam, um, you, you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, yeah. you, you need imagination. It's not, you know, some uh, very old school historians are like, you know, it's just about just a documentary recap. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and this is very clear uh, in the book. And this is where I also go back to my original question of this kind of uh, native thinker or uh, one that has certain uh, freedom within fabric to say, you know what, I have lived through similar situations in similar spaces. I have a lineage that sends me back. I always say when I go back to, uh, you know, um, uh, the stories of my grandmother, I'm getting the stories of her grandmother, which sends me back to the early uh, uh, 19th century. Um, and so, uh, in a way, being a native uh, thinker on something really means a lot. And to me, that a lot in this book. Um, and so uh, I just want to take a moment to, uh, to honor uh, uh, that, that this is uh, uh, quite a, a, an impressive uh, way of uh, bringing oneself to, to, uh, to the historicizing profession. Um, in terms of this idea of field, I am curious um, now, this is something that we are struggling with in our some class, 
what makes something uh, Arab studies? What makes something uh, a study of the Arab peoples? Um, I mean, does this idea give you pause and can you reflect on it uh, in any way you like? Different scholars have done it in different ways. Zachary Lockman gave us uh, a huge survey of the field of Middle East studies. Uh, Hanan Tupan talked to us about the culture. Uh, whatever you bring to us uh, would be great. Uh, well, it's gonna be a very simple answer. I think anything that is uh, uh, produced in the Arabic language by Arabic speaking peoples to me is, is Arab studies. End of story. I mean, to me, it's, uh, uh, it's as, you know, as broad as I could make it. Um, I mean, if I were studying um, uh, Arabs living in Buenos Aires, or, you know, it, it, this is all Arab to me, everything that is about Arabic speaking peoples who are being engaged in their everyday lives, you know, that's to me is, 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 is Arab studies. I love I love that simple. Just keep it simple, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I have one last question. Um, how do you contend with political history over the twentieth century when you are dealing with you know your ways of thinking is a history from below? Uh, you do, do take micro historical approaches. Uh, you do, um, you know, this is a people's history in a way. Uh, this is also a social history in a way. Uh, this is a history of technology uh, in a way. So you, you are using multiple uh, vantage points and multiples, multiple ways of thinking while looking at this book. Now, political history is what commonly is understood as history, which is driven by state, um, you know, especially over the last 200 years, um, it's, you know, when we're looking at history of modern Egypt, what are the political histories? What are the treaties? W what happened here? How did this border uh, happen and so on? So how do you, do you reckon with this perception that political history is history uh, versus all the viewpoints that you bring, which include history as well? Yeah. Um... I don't want to make it sound like I'm, this has been happening, sort of that transition from political history to, to more of a broad cultural history has been happening for the last 30 plus years. Um, and all I'm doing here is, is adding more of a sensory element to it a little bit more and getting us more to the street level. Um, I would say that most of, uh, uh, probably some of, the, some of the best histories that I've read in, in the last 20, 25 years tend to move away from the strict definition of sort of a political history. Um, um, and that's certainly the case in, 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 in American academia and, and, and Western academia, less so uh, in, 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 in Egypt per se. Uh, like if, if you're looking at scholarship that's coming out, but not entirely, but there, there are ex exceptions to the rule. But uh, hopefully that will shift there as well, where uh, uh, there's more value assigned to, to, to the cultural production of peoples and uh, in everyday life as opposed to, uh, you know, King Farouk and Sabzan rule and so forth. Um, and though I, I made a concerted effort here, with the exception when uh, uh, I discussed sort of the, the state sort of policing the streets, uh, to, to stay away from uh, 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 the, the elites and, 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 and the kings and the prime ministers and, and so forth. Um, but um, but it's not necessarily, it's, it's not necessary. I mean, you can still incorporate them uh, to some extent, which most likely because my next book is on radio uh, uh, because, event, because by 34, it was state controlled. Many of those elites will, will, will feature in it. Uh, but there's always this contestation as we moved through some of the earlier questions. So, um, but it's changing, like history is changing. Um, and so, uh, uh, not in every institution and not in every history department, um, but it, it is something that uh, with newer generation of, of scholars, um, but even uh, even the, the, the just the prior generation also, they, they already started a lot of this 20, 30 years ago. So. Cool. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahmi. It is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, what a great book. What a great lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your generosity, Samad, and uh, thank you all for attending.
Uh, and uh, good luck in, with the rest of the class. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Thank en you. enjoy uh, sunny California. So yeah. take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.